Welcome back. Now we're going to continue in our conversation about the doctrine of sin. The doctrine of sins. And what we're looking at now is the doctrine of sins. This is plural now. We're looking at the plurality of sin. Up until this time, we had been in a long discussion over a number of classes on the, uh, on the singularity of the word sin, its nature, its basic nature. Now we've been looking at the sins, S-I-N-S, which is the plurality. We looked at the personal sins. We looked at the sin nature. Now we're going to look, we're going to go to number three. Number three is going to be called imputed sins. Okay? Imputed. That's what we want to look at. We want to look at imputed sin. This is the, if you recall, the full discussion that we had on this issue. I don't think and I don't believe that we need to go back into the details of it since we've already discussed it. But with regard to, I'm speaking to somebody who's never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm speaking to a church that has never been indoctrinated, if you will, in the doctrines of the word of God. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of churches like this where they'll hear a thematic message. They'll hear some kind of a story told, everything but an expedition, everything but an expositional teaching on the word of God. And you can go into church after church after church where there has been a willful, open declaration not to teach doctrine. Now that's a little confusing because the word doctrine is teaching. And what is teaching? Teaching the Word of God. So the, now the question has to be, what is it that they're teaching? Because it's beyond me that you can avoid doctrine and be in the church. Yet, we have this phenomenon that exists all over the world. So I want to speak to the unbeliever. I want to speak to the brand new Christian. I want to speak to the church that has been never indoctrinated. I want to speak to the person we're walking down the street and they go, well, what, what do you mean? You know, what, 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 what are you talking about the doctrine of sin? Now, specifically, we get to imputed sin. Turn your Bibles back to Romans chapter 5. And this is a familiar passage to us in this class because we've spent so much time in it. And I want to draw your attention here to verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 again. He says, therefore, just as through one man, this is the key, one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. The key to understanding imputation is right here in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. So when we look at Romans chapter 5, verse 12, okay, when we look at that, I want us to draw attention when he says, He's, and and nobody says in verse 12, he says, through, he says, through one man. That is the heart of imputation. What one man did, he thus became, through one man, what one man did, Thus, the rest of us become guilty of what that one man did. That's called imputation. It is, let's use another word. This has been ascribed to us. In the old English, it's been reckoned. To us, it has been credited to us. If you go to court of law and you walk into the drugstore, you walk into a candy store, you walk into a grocery store, and you walk in with your friend and you have no idea, but your friend pulls out a gun and robs the place. And you both run out. Now, you did not pull the gun. You did not rob the place. Your friend pulled out the gun. You know, see, it was your friend who pulled the gun out, and your friend is the one who, uh, who uh, and he ran. You panic, and you ran also. Okay? Now, according to the law, you, my friend, you are an accomplice. 
Okay? You're an accomplice to this. You are an accomplice. Okay? I want you to understand. Okay? In other words, his crime is accredited to you. His crime is reckoned to you. His crime is, is, is ascribed to you. Why? Because you did nothing to prevent it. You panicked in a state of fear and you ran, which tells the judge and it tells the law that you still had the ability to make a decision. By virtue of your presence, you are now an accomplice. Now, let's take this one step further. Sin, the nature of it, has been imputed to you because the federal head or federal headship, if you remember that teaching, was Adam. Adam was not born. Adam was created. From the loins of Adam, you and I are born. So whatever was ascribed to him is ascribed unto us. So imputation is how we arrive at sin. And so we're born with the sin nature. So the meaning to impute is to ascribe to, to reckon to. Remember what we're talking about now? We're talking about the explanation here. Right? It means to, it, the imputation of sin occurred originally when the sin of Adam was charged to the account of every person. That is the consequence of original sin. When you look at original sin, if you recall, we, we dealt with this in the first few classes when we talked about original sin. What I want to remind you of is that original sin is not what Adam and Eve did. Original sin is the consequences of what Adam and Eve did, and it is ascribed to us. The results of what they did. Mm -hmm. So the imputation of sin is not arbitrarily charging people with sins for which they are not naturally responsible for, but reckoning, accounting, ascribing to them the guilt that they deserve. Imputation of sin is charged to all because we are all connected with Adam's race. We understand this concept. <clears throat> we understand the concept through physical disease. Uh, if, you're, um, if your family has, um, if there's a high propensity for, for diabetes in your family, what tends to happen to the progeny? What, has, what tends to happen to the descendants? Many of them wind up with what? With diabetes, right? You have, a, you have this propensity for, this tendency toward, okay? Um, and we, we, we understand, of course, there's learned behavior here. I understand all that. <clears throat> okay? But in the genetic pool, mm -hmm, in, in, and as your genetics are passed down from one generation to the other, to the next generation, and so forth, okay? you now have, you don't have to have diabetes, but there's going to likelihood you're going to have it because, okay, we all, we're, we're, pro, we're not only a product of a physical, spiritual being, but we're also a product of learned behavior, where we've learned a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in my family, diabetes runs really big, okay? Why? Because we overeat everything. It's not complicated to understand. Now, I don't have to have diabetes, do you understand? But what happens is that, so, the, so you're going to have a high sugar count, so forth and so forth. Now, see, we understand that, right? And you go, well, it's not my fault that, that, that I have diabetes. My mother and father had diabetes, and I got diabetes, okay? So do you, run around, do you run around all day saying, well, you know, mom, dad, you know, it's your fault that I have diabetes. Right? You don't do that, right? Now, you may do that, but you don't do that naturally, right? And so then your mother and father says, turns around to your grandparents and says, well, well, the reason we have diabetes is because you, because you guys had diabetes. And so now your, great, so now your grandparents turn around to your great-grandparents and they say the same thing. Does that kind of a conversation happen? No. Because all families have a tendency of something being passed down. See, we understand the concept. We do. What we have a problem with is that we understand it physically, we understand it in the physiology, but we somehow have chosen to reject it spiritually. We have the same situation spiritually. That's what imputation is. So what the federal headship, what, the, what our parents, 
Adam and Eve, if you will, the result of their actions, the consequences of their actions is now passed down to us. So let's illustrate this a little bit. Look at the illustration. Simple. Now I'm not going to get to the details of it because we've already done this already. But in the illustration, God not, God not, God not only imputes sin. He not only imputes the sin of Adam to the race, to the human race, but he also offers to do the same with the righteousness of Christ. Now, I want you to understand something about imputation. Okay? If your argument is, it's not fair that I should be credited with Adam's sins, then you've got a bigger problem then you should also have the same argument that I should not be credited with the righteousness of Christ. You remember I said to you a number of classes ago, one plus one equals two. Let's take the first one and call that sin. Take the second one and call this righteousness of Christ. And here's the sin of Adam. Okay. So we're going to take the sin of Adam, right? That's one. Plus the righteousness of Christ. Okay? And we can see this equals two, right? Because in any mathematical equation, one plus one equals two. But what man wants is, this is what man is looking at. Man does not want the sin nature of Adam plus, but he has no problems accepting the righteousness of Christ, and he still wants this to come out to be two. See, this is, this is, where, this is where one plus one is not two, one plus one is 11. Because they're trying to keep a parallel truth into some kind of aquatic formula, and it doesn't work. So what I want you to understand is that imputation works two ways. Now, we're not talking about the doctrine of salvation yet. We'll get to that in our next settings. But right now, I want you to understand why the importance of imputation of sin is so important because we have the flip side of that is about to come. Look at this in Romans chapter 5, verse 21. He says this, so, so God, not, God not only imputes the sin of Adam to the human race, but he also offers to do the same with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5, we read tw verse 12, right? Now look at verse 21. He says this, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through how? Through the righteousness of e to eternal life through Jesus Christ Christ our Lord. The same way that God has credited us, us being the human race with the sin of Adam, the sin nature, now God credits us with the divine nature of Jesus Christ at salvation. You don't hear, I don't hear anybody saying, well, not my fault that Jesus Christ righteous has got applied to me. I, I've never heard anybody say that. I, I, I honestly, I've never heard anybody complain. That's, you know, not my fault that I'm going to heaven because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I don't think it's fair. I don't hear that argument. So you need to be consistent with whatever your argument's going to be. So as I'm walking down the street and I'm talking to somebody about, um, uh, uh, about, uh, the, um, about the imputation, you know, I need them to understand that in both cases, it's the work of God. It's not based on their merit. You see, if your argument is, well, it's not fair. I do not deserve that I should have to pay for the sins of Adam. It's just not fair. Well, then you better use that same argument. Well, I don't deserve to receive, the righteousness of, to receive the righteousness of Christ and go to heaven either. You see, when God imputes, when God imputes the righteousness of Christ to the account of a believer, not the non-believer, but to the believer, 
He makes the person's record as good or as perfect as Jesus Christ's record is. So here's the question. You've heard the explanation. You understand the illustration. Now, what's the application? Imputed righteousness is the only remedy for imputed sin. Imputed righteousness I need you to understand something. Imputed righteousness, what is not yours, but given to you, is the only, this is the application, is the only remedy that you have for imputed sin. You cannot have one without the other. But you must be intellectually honest to recognize that. Because you were born a child of wrath at birth. That's the reason why we have to look at this subject. Why we need to take the time to teach through it in the church and to everybody that we... we see, this, by the way, I use this for the purposes of evangelism. Yeah, I do it all the time. I use it all the time. Now, let's look at the next one. Okay. Now, let me, let, me, let me also now, as we're talking about the issue of sin, okay? I, wanted, I want you to look at this with me because I want you to see this next one, okay? Because this is a subject that comes up a lot in the churches, okay? We're going to take number four, okay? Let's take number four. And this, they call it back sliding, Okay? Backsliding is the term that you hear a lot, okay? And let's go into the book of Jeremiah. I believe it's Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22. Let me double check to make sure I'm not wrong. But it's Jeremiah chapter 3. So let's turn your Bibles to Jeremiah. And let's read this in its proper context, please. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3, please. And we're going to look at this concept called backsliding. Okay? Now, in this chapter of chapter 3 of the book of, of, of Jeremiah, okay, God has now set out through the prophet Jeremiah, through the person of the Holy Spirit, that he now unpacks, unfolds, and delivers his word through the person and the power of the Holy Spirit into the life of the prophet Jeremiah so that his people can hear his word. And what God is doing here, he's giving, a, he's invite. He look, he's, how would I put it? Um, he's inviting his people to a state of repentance, a state of repentance. That's what's unfolding in this chapter here. So let's look at this together. I want you to see this with me. In Jeremiah chapter 3, um, let's please uh, indulge me here. And um, well, let's see. Uh, let's back it up to verse 6, please. Verse 6, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6. Then the Lord, it said, said to, the day, said to me in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what faithless Israel did? Have you seen what faithless Israel did? So obviously Israel failed to be faithful. Have you seen what faithful, faithless Israel did? She went up on every high hill and under every green tree and she was a harlot there. This was the people of God. I thought after she had done all these things, she will return to me. Now, here's the key phrase. She will return to me, but she did not, and 
her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ, a writ, okay, a decree, a letter of divorce. I sent her away with this, and yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went, she went and was a harlot also. So we have the northern kingdom, we have the southern kingdom. They have now both turned their backs on God. Verse 9, because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. In other words, she was worshiping, uh, worshiping other gods, creating gods out of, uh, out of stones and trees and so forth like this. Look at verse 10. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception declares the Lord. So you, could, you can begin to see here that um, that. What you have here is that what you have is spiritual adultery, okay? spiritual holotry is taking place here. Their first love is no longer God. Now they've gone into the way of the world, the way of paganism, the way of heathenism, and so forth and so forth. So you're beginning to see that this is the picture that's being painted here. And I want you to keep that in mind when we deal with this issue of backsliding and how we get to that issue. Now, it's, it's not a word that I particularly prefer, okay? But it is the word that I believe most of the church world at least today, they understand that word, that term. So I'm just going to go with that term. Okay? And so we see here, starting in verse 11, and the Lord said to me, faithless Israel. Now, this is a call. This is a call to repent from my backslidden position. Now, I just finished literally describing to you what backsliding is from verse 6 to verse 10. I once served God, once I loved God, I, I believed God, I was faithful to his word, I now give him my back, and now I go by way of something else, something away from God. I have now, set, I have now completely divorced myself from the things of God. I'm in what they, a lot of people would call the backslidden position. This was the position that Israel and Judah, both of them, found themselves in. Now call, God is making a call just like you make a call to a backslidden believer. Okay? He says in verse 11, And the Lord said to me, Faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say this to them. Look at this. Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity. You have to actually recognize that you messed up. And, you, and that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, O faithless sons declares the Lord, for I am a master to you, and I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. It shall be in those days that when you are multiplied and increased in the land, declares the Lord, they will no longer say, the ark the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and it will not come to mind, nor will they remember it, nor will they miss it, nor will it be made again. At that time, in verse 17, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will be gathered to it, to Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord, nor will they walk anymore after the stubbornness of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel, and they will come together from the land of the north to the land that I gave your fathers as an inheritance. Then I said, how would I set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of the nations? And I said, you shall call me my father and not turn away from following me. Surely, as a woman treacherously departs from her lover, so you have dealt treacherously with me, 
O house of Israel, declares the Lord. Notice the parallelism that God is using in this language. It's a language that they understand. This becomes key when you and I are teaching doctrine. We must speak in a language that our people understand and yet remain faithful to the text. We don't need to invent new words, new popular culturalized words. We don't need to do that. What we need to do is to explain the language that's before us, the people understand. Look at verse 20. Surely as a woman treacherously departs from her lover, so you have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. A voice, he says, a voice is heard on the bare heights, the weeping and the supplications of the sons of Israel, because they have perverted their way. They have forgotten the Lord their God. And now look at what he says in verse 22. He's return, O faithless sons. Return and I will heal your faithlessness. Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord your God. Now, as I look at that in my Hebrew text here, and I want to make sure that I have this correct in my Hebrew text, so I give it the proper explanation. And we see this down here in verse 22. Where he says in verse 22, Return, O faithless sons, and I will hear your, faithful, your faithlessness, right? And so as I read that in the, in the Hebrew text, um, when he says, you faithless sons, right, in the New American Standard Version of it, okay, um, this is where we get this term. Faithless sons. Okay. This is where we get the Hebrew text here. Uh, the, the word uh, in the King James Version, okay, is the word backsliding. And this is where we get this word, okay. Um, and I believe it's the Meshuba, right? Yes. It's the word here. Okay. It's going to be the word Meshuba, okay. Yes. Um, and I want you to see this with me. Now, this word, um, it has a number of different applications. Uh, I like the way the new, uh, the new American Standard Version uses it. It says faithless. Okay? Um, we also get a, a couple of other words with this. Um, and, 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 this is, and this is basically, um, this would be a turning away. Turning away. Okay, people who are turned their way. Okay? Backsliding is I here I am with the heaven before the living God. I'm serving him. I'm serving his word. I'm serving his church. I'm serving and being obedient to his word. And then I turn away and now I've gone in another direction, completely the opposite of God. Okay? Um, there is the word meshuba, okay, or meshuba. is also the word in the Hebrew text that is used for apostasy, apostasy. However, a believer, I don't believe, a true genuine believer. Now, you can have a religious person, and I may be wrong, and I can be corrected on that, and I've been corrected on a number of things, so I'm not, I'm not embarrassed and ashamed to say that to you. But what I can tell you is that um, apostasy is coming to the complete state of unbelief. And that's not the context and it's not the text that we find here. But it is a turning away. Is it possible to turn away? Is it possible to find yourself in a state of unfaithfulness? Yes. That's the reason why I do use the word backsliding. I don't like that word, but it is the word in the original King James Version. That's where we get that from, being faithless. Okay. Um, 
the, the, the reason I, this is my personal opinion, my, my, my own personal conjecture, is that the way um, I was taught backsliding, and you have to understand that in the church that um, I, in the church that I started out in, in the church that as a believer, uh, the way backsliding was explained to us, and this was, a, and I started out in a Baptist church. I want you to understand that, okay? So before you get any, and, and, and I, I wasn't in some cult or some sect or some, you know, um, heretical uh, group. I was in a Southern Baptist church in which it was a very large church, um, uh, and I want you to understand, and we, and we were literally taught that backsliding, okay, was literally was somebody, okay, who completely disavowed God. And, and the problem with that notion, as I grew in the faith and grew in the knowledge of the Word of God and, and grew in doctrine and so forth, is that a genuine believer does not commit apostasy. A genuine believer does not disavow God, does not turn his back on God, okay, and just completely become heretical. No. There are a lot of religious people who commit apostasy. And it was, that's the only reason why I didn't use the word backsliding. Okay? Because the way, and then later on as I, as I began to teach in, 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 different, in different Baptist churches, I found out they said the same thing. And then I taught in a lot of other Baptist churches, and they didn't say that either. They didn't say that. They said quite the opposite. You know, they said, no, these are people who are temporarily faithless and blah, blah. So you could see the confusion. Um, so I, but I do use the term because I want to address the issue. You can't run from issues. You have to address the issues. Mm -hmm. So I want you to understand. So in the explanation, the word backslide in the Meshubah, as the, as the way it's being used in the Hebrew text here, okay, it literally means turning back or turning away. That's the literal definition. Although it occurs throughout the Old Testament, Moses and Jeremiah especially use it to describe Israel's failure in their covenant relationship with God. That's exactly how that is being used. I want you to understand that. The concept of backsliding is ascribed to, in many churches when they teach doctrine, to the person, to the individual believer. But the way the Bible uses it in the Old Testament, from Moses all the way to Jeremiah, it was ascribed to the nation of Israel. Now set that notion aside for the moment. I just wanted to point that out to you so that you understand that believers can become faithless and turn away and repent. They can do that. But I don't believe that's a state of apostasy. That's a whole different teaching. Okay. So let's look at the illustration of this. The illustration of this. Let's look at this. <clears throat> backsliding, backsliding, sorry, backsliding implied. I think it's the only way I know how to say it. Backsliding implied a stubborn and rebellious attitude on the part of ancient Israel and may have referred to either to either to their forsaking the covenant in whole or in part or to their failure to grow spiritually according to God's progressive revelation. Again, I don't want to be the dead horse here, but I do want to draw your attention that backsliding is a concept that is taught about the nation of Israel. So let's look at now the application. How, then how do I take this, okay, and how do we apply it as I'm walking through and speaking to somebody, I'm walking down the road and I'm talking to them about the word of God, uh, or I like to ride the city bus, um, and, uh, and, and the reason is because um, you get an opportunity to meet a lot of people that you don't normally meet at least in my circle, right, as a pastor. 
I mean, I don't come across a whole lot of heathens and unbelievers because in my world, I'm operating out of the church, right? But uh, the way to keep me um, rooted and grounded in the Word of God and honest is that I've got to deal and interact with the world. And so one of the best ways is get on the bus and you talk to people. It doesn't happen every single day, but I can tell you this, that, 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 that from time to time you do engage people and you start begin to talk to them. And they're just, and you hear all kinds of different things. So how do I apply this? You know, the term uh, is often applied today. I'm talking about today to Christians who have fallen into sin. That's how this word backsliding is being used. It's not how it was used in the biblical text. But it is, remember when I talked to you about church interpretation and biblical interpretation? Remember that? You, you recall that? Okay. So now, biblical interpretation is telling us that it is, a, a, that the concept is applicable to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Church interpretation is saying that it's applicable to a Christian who has a failure. Okay. So, so I want you to understand that. If we're going to teach doctrine properly, you need to understand how, how, how doctrine is being used in and out of the church. So the term is often applied today to Christians who have fallen to sin. But it could also apply to those who have failed to grow spiritually. So you see, you see that these two groups of people. So this concept of backsliding was to the nation of Israel. But you see it applied to individuals this way. Okay? And these are the, these are the two main ways, okay? This is to the believer who has, who has fallen into sin and the believer who has failed to grow spiritually. Okay. One day I'm going to learn how to write. Now, I want you to, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but I do want you to see this with me for a moment. If this is the modern day application to this, believers who fall into sin and believers who fail to grow spiritually, if that is true, then you have an entire church today, New Testament, post-New Testament, modern church, post-modern church, the entire, the entire church is in a state of back, is is in a backslidden state. If you follow this to its literal meaning, but this is how that word is used. Uh, you remember I said this to you, um, and I said this in a, it bears repeating that the longer a word stays in the language, it doesn't matter what language you're talking about. In this case, we happen to be teaching in the English language here. But, it, but just, you find the same thing is true in other languages around the world. As long as, as long as a word stays in the English language and it's not removed or just doesn't die or doesn't become archaic, the more that same word will obtain will inherit new meanings and new applications to it. And if we don't understand that, we may be guilty of misapplication of that term. For our purposes, I'm taking the word backsliding because it's the word that the church world it's not the word that the Bible uses in the New Testament, but it is the word in the Old Testament that's used to describe the spiritual condition of Israel. Now, the way the church uses it is to describe a believer who has either fallen into sin or failed to grow spiritually. If you understand that that's what it means, that it does not mean apostasy, somebody who has not walked away completely from the faith. 
Because the only thing they did was that they backslide. Okay? Now, we think it's this. It's not that. What it means is that somebody has literally turned away. Their whole sight, everything about their lives is toward a complete different direction. Now, the physical backsliding, I'm still looking at the same thing, but I've distanced myself. That's not what backsliding means. You see why words mean things? But you have to define the concept. Okay? It's a literally turning away in a state of apostasy. But that's not how it's being used by the church in relationship to believers. I want you to understand that. Now, where it gets a little dicey, a little more complicated, and you think I'm beating a dead horse here, so I'm not, it's here. Go to 1 Corinthians. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians. I want you to go to chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's look at verses 1 to 3. Now, I want to throw a word up here. Because uh, this is where a lot of churches, again, the church world, takes this word, and how they applied this concept of backsliding, they applied in this term, cardinal. So turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. And look with me, starting in verse 1. Now, the, let me tell you what the Apostle Paul is doing here, okay? Um, Paul is giving us a description of what's taking place. And what he is saying is there is a division among the believers. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Chapter 3, chapter 3, yeah. So I want you to see this now. And he's giving us a description in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And he's describing what's taking place. What's taking place is sectarianism. Sectarianism. Now, what that means is that they've been divided. Okay? One group was following one guy, another group is following another guy, another group is following another guy, another group is following another guy, and another group is following another guy. Okay? And they were all claiming that. Okay? And so, what Paul is, he's describing sectarianism, okay? And he's describing it in terms of carnality or He's describing it as the work, it's cardinal work. It's the work of the flesh. This is how he's describing it. So let's look at the text. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let's start with verse 1. Okay. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, cardinal-minded, as to infants in Christ. This is where we get this concept, okay? This, in fact, I just want to make sure. Uh, I'm reading a New American Standard Version, so let me go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And if I look at that, in the uh, King James, is going to say, but as unto cardinal. In the uh, New King James, it says, as unto cardinal. 
in the uh, New American Standard Version, it says, as unto flesh. So I want you to know how words get used. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to understand that. So look what he says here. So he says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh or carnal, as to the infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able. In other words, they're infantile. They have not grown spiritually. They've not matured sufficiently. For you are still fleshly. You're still cardinal. Still, um, um, you, you're still cardinal minded. Okay, and and that's proven because you now you 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 are developing some kind of a uh, um, uh, um, jealousy and and strife. You follow me? And, and that's what he. In fact, he's telling us here in the uh, New King James Version. He says, "And I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you." You are not fleshly and you are not walking like mere men in the New King James Version. So this is what he's telling us here. He says it here very likely, the very, the very same way here in the New American Standard Version. For you are still fleshly, for, for, since there is, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not fleshly and are you not walking? So Paul is, Paul is calling them out, okay? He's calling them out. And, and, and this, this, this uh, fallenness or, or this flesh, okay, or this um, uh, carnality, okay, produces the attitude of jealousy. And, 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 and it's really, you know what that is? It's, it's a serious form. Uh, jealousy is a serious form of selfishness. That's what it's a serious form of, selfishness. Look at this. And, and now Paul goes on to describe this. Look at verse 4. For one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not mere men? Right? That's what he says. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed each, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one, right? So he goes on to explain this in more detail, right? So now, So this is the reason why we get into this issue that they have either you fall into sin or you fail to grow spiritually. Okay? So he begins to lay out for us okay, the, the attitudes of this, the manifestations of this. So we would have to ask the question, so the cause of backsliding, what does that mean? It's the desire to do all things our way rather than God's way. I think that's the best I think it's the simplest way of, 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 of uh, stating it, okay? In, in the book of Proverbs, we find this, in, um, and, and Proverbs really is more eloquent the way it says it, okay? In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14, in Proverbs 14, 14, he says it this way to us. He says, the backslider in heart, okay, will have his fill of his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied with his. Christians should be careful to follow the Lord and grow in grace so as not to backslide. So you begin to understand how this concept is used. Okay? And I want you to, now I want you to see this with me because I think it really is, I think we fail, we fail miserably, all right? Um, when we, when we don't apply the truth of this word in a way that makes sense, not just culturally, not just intellectually, but we must also be true theologically as well as doctrinally biblical. Okay? I want you to understand that. Mm -hmm. So I, this is a convoluted area in the doctrines, not because the Bible is convoluted, not because the biblical interpretation is convoluted, it's because the church world has now moved from interpretation to application. 
and in the church world, it has really failed to clarify its illustrations, and its illustrations has led to a misapplication. I hope that makes sense when we begin to look at this a much broader way. Now, when we go into Proverbs, and let's go back up into Proverbs chapter 14, and let's go to 14, 14, uh, because I, I want to make sure that we see it the way the scriptures tells us because he says that the backslider in heart will also have fulfilled. So when I go into 14.14, 14, that word is also going to take me So here's what I want to do with you. When he says in, in, in Proverbs 14, 14, he says, he uses this word, okay, backslider. And I hear this a lot in the modern churches, okay, at least on this side of the cross. And Proverbs 14, 14 is the single verse that gets used to describe the Christian. Now remember, this is a course on doctrine, okay? So we, we, we're going to have to deal with the theological issues that are involved. So when you hear this word, uh, backslider, uh, backslider, and it's out of Proverbs 14, 14. This word, backslider, okay, is the word sug in the Hebrew text, okay? It's the word sug. And the word, now remember, it's in the, it's in the Hebrew scriptures. So I, I need you to, you, you may not think this is important, but it is important. It's in the Hebrew scriptures, which is why I do not call Christians... Let me stop there. Let me correct myself. I personally, in my opinion, now I just I just jumped out of doctrine. I just jumped out of the, uh, uh, theological thought here. Just just I just want to understand. That. I want to make sure that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. In my opinion, I cannot and I will not call Christians backsliders. I I just won't do that. Okay. Because the word that they're using for backsliding and and the one text that they use for that is Proverbs 14, 14. And the problem is that this is a Hebrew scripture speaking about the Hebrew nation. And the word backslider there is the word sug. And the word sug literally means, literally is apostatized. That means you have literally turned, you didn't, you, look, I, I know this is stupid, you know, I'm, I'm not doing that, what, what do you call that, Michael Jansen, uh, what was that thing called, moonwalk, or whatever that thing was, I forget what you call the thing, okay, okay, you know, and, and, and for me, I'll just call it, you know, you know, people, this is how people look at backsliding, that they, they have literally, they, they're still turned toward God, but they have distanced themselves from God, okay, and that's the mental picture. That's not the word backsliding. Backsliding is to literally turn your back on God. Reject truth that you know, but you reject truth that you have confessed to be truth. You now reject it completely. That's apostasy, and you go in a completely different direction. That's the reason why I cannot apply the word backslider or backslidden condition to the Christian. But I do, however, acknowledge how the church is attempting to use that term. But since this is a course on doctrine, 
then we ought to be precise in what we're saying. So in my humble opinion, you may not think I'm humble at all, but I want you to understand something. I cannot apply that word to a Christian. Now, he may find himself with carnality. He may find himself with carnal thoughts. He may find himself that he has fallen to sin and that, in fact, he is he's failing to grow spiritually. But that's, so those are completely distinct concepts, 100% completely different from being this, somebody who was apostatizing. Okay. So we need to be very clear, and I would beg you, Pastor, okay, that you need to be very careful in the concepts that you are imputing and transmitting, okay, into the lives of your people. Because what you have said is you have condemned somebody. And the problem with this is that you nor I have no authority. We don't have any authority to condemn anybody. We just don't. We just don't. Unless you are clearly saying that these people are now engaging in apostasy. But that's not what a lot of you are saying. What many of you are saying is that this person has either fallen into sin or this person has failed to grow spiritually. And that's the reason why they find themselves in the spiritual hole that they find themselves in. That's the reason why this issue of backsliding becomes so important. Because the biblical interpretation is that. The church interpretation is what I've been describing to you. And that's where you and I are going to have to make a distinction and be very, very clear about what we're talking about.